wonderful to have you here to worship with us today. And I have good news for you. God loves you. And because God loves you, God's presence is going to be here with us as we worship. So who's ready to worship today? Who wants to worship our Lord? Amen. Yeah. And God is here and God's going to bless that worship. So I want you guys to please stand up and welcome those around you. <laughs> And we just want to share with you a little bit of what went on. It didn't mute on MP3. On the board, hit MP3 and mute it. Thank you. 
Let's celebrate and uh, fellowship together as we have the yummy, yummy breakfast. Uh, that'll be at 730. Uh, then this week, all this week, uh, we're going to take the same theme that we had here in Vacation Bible School and apply it and make it into this building, into the CLC Music Factory. Uh, that's going to be the 17th through the 20th. That's going to be kindergarten through fifth grade, I believe. And that's going to be from 9 a.m. to noon. And then finally, our last announcement is Sunday Night Live. going to be July 23rd, uh, 5 to 7 p.m. And that's going to be a great time of fellowship and fun. Uh, there are other announcements. I encourage you to look in your bulletin and find those announcements and find things, that, uh, ways for you to connect in our church. Uh, I want to invite now our ushers to come forward as we prepare to offer God our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Lord God, we ask now that as we give these gifts, these gifts to you, that you might take them and bless them and make them into a way to spread your love and your grace throughout Hot Springs, Garland County, even beyond the borders of Arkansas and the United States, into the world. Because this is a world that's hurting and broken. A world that needs to know that God loves them. This is our way to move beyond the places we go and the people we see. By giving these gifts, Lord, we pray that your kingdom increases. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>
invite uh, Justin Nicholas to come forward to read our scripture for today. All right, our scripture today comes from the fourth chapter of Acts 5 through 13. If you have your Bible, you're, you're certainly welcome to follow along. The next day, the leaders, elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem, along with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because of something good was because something good was done for a sick person, a good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. Now he has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. The council was caught by surprise by the confidence with which Peter and John spoke. After all, they understood that these apostles were uneducated and inexperienced. They also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated, and uh, I believe Greg Schaefer is going to offer our, uh, our God moment today. So, uh, many of you who know me know that um, my, my journey has been a little different than most. I, I started out uh, born to two Jewish parents, and I, my, all of their parents were Jewish. But they had lapsed long before um, I came along. And we really had no formal religion through the family growing up. But uh, they worked on Saturdays, and they dropped my brother and I uh, off at 7 o'clock in the morning at our grandparents' apartment building. And there happened to be a, a worship service there in the morning on Saturdays. It was a Jewish service. And it was the only thing for these, you know, six and five and, uh, and growing up until I was about 12. A place for us to go where there were people to be with and so we would go and I learned the prayers and I learned about uh, Noah and Moses and Isaac and Abraham and the the Old Testament Bible and I believed and I always believed but we never had any formal religion and then when I was about 12 um, I was in a terrible car accident and I uh, nearly lost my left leg I spent a year in bed um, and as I was recovering over the next several years, my, my, my mother, who had no religion, would nonetheless tell me, there's a reason that this, there's, it will connect somewhere in your life to something, and it will all make sense. And a lot of years later, uh, I met my wife, who uh, almost every day at this church knows, I think, at some point. Um, and, and when I met her, um, she had about 18 months before uh, lost her husband to a drunk driver. And I was hit by a drunk driver. And as we told each other the stories of our lives in those first weeks when we knew, where we were getting to know each other, I knew that, that that was the thing. It was an instant connection that we had because we'd both been through this experience. And, and that was the God moment for me, realizing that, that I went through this thing, but it put me in a place to meet her and to instantly connect with her. And when we decided to get married and we talked about having children, I said, you, you've been involved and engaged with your religion. Your mother has, has been involved and engaged in Methodism your whole life. And that's what I want for my kids because I saw a grounding in them and a, a, a way of looking at the world and, and the way that Kate got through her moment of losing her first husband when she was very young, um, it just meant the world to me. And I wanted my kids to have that resilience and that faith and that understanding. And so most of you know, if you ask me what my religion is today, I say, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know I was born Jewish and I, I love those traditions. Um, I've been coming to church, uh, Methodist church, 
every Sunday for the last 22 years, as long as I've known Kate. And so what I know is I believe in God. I've seen him work in my life, in my kids' lives, in, in my, my wife's family's lives. And uh, I wouldn't be who I am without that. So. Our children want to come up and have a little talk with a uh, kid this morning. Okay. Here she comes. All right, where's my kids from BBS? Come on down, Kate. Good to see you, Sister Bye. All right, come on down. We need that microphone. Oh, good. Shaper just had. Here it is. Thank you. Because these kids learned some stuff this week at BBS. I mean, they were brilliant scholars and young theologians, so they're going to share with the microphone. Have a seat, sweetie. Good job. Oh, so good. So this week I had the privilege of teaching the big kids in BBS, and we learned a lot of stuff, didn't we? Woo! Each day. But today we're going to focus on what we talked about, the Bible story we talked about on Thursday, the last day. So, see... See some of my big ones that were in here. Would you mind giving us a little synopsis with the helmet there? Yes, no? Would that be not good? Okay, I don't know. It's okay. You're just my little theater girl. I thought maybe. No? Okay. Hampton, do you want to? Oh, were you in my class this week? You, oh, you missed out, Wesley. You missed out. Were you in Wednesday or Thursday? No? And you were in the itty bitties. Who else? I don't have anybody in my big ends. All right, so here goes the story. You were, but you weren't in my big kid class. Helen Claire, I'm sure you can't give us a little 411. Okay, Helen Claire, who um, did we talk about on Thursday? Who was the strong, amazing peacemaker of a woman? What was her name? Abigail. Say it louder. Abigail. Abigail. Abigail was. And who did she go and try to make peace? With. Do you remember Hampton? Um, what was his name? He went on to be king, but you know, at this point he wasn't king yet. He had a real guest. Who? David. David. Very good, girls. Thank you. Our story that we talked about on Thursday was Abigail, who she went to interview. David was really, really, really mad at a guy who did him wrong, Nabal, right? And Abigail said, I, am, I have the abilities to make this right. So what she did was she gathered up all this grain and food and all this good stuff. And she took her donkeys and she rode to David. And she said to David, what did she say? Girls, can you help me out? What did she say, Hampton? David, don't kill my family. Very Take good. this food. Very good. She was a peacemaker and she said... David, you are going to, you're going to regret this. Please, God has bigger plans for you. Here's the food. Let me make it right for you. And she used her words and the gifts that God gave her to calm David down. Now, a lot of times we use our words and it doesn't work, does it? But she knew that she needed to do this and she used her gifts. She went to David. God softened David's heart. He calmed down from being so mad. He listened to what Abigail said, right? And then oh, he said, thank you, Abigail. You are right. I am going to listen to you, and I am just going to let God take care of this, and I'm going to go on and do what God asked me to do. So that is what we learned on Thursday. And I like to take it, and we focus on Abigail being a peacemaker. So she was being a peacemaker and doing God's work. But I want to add one more thing that we didn't talk about on Thursday. What we did talk about is Abigail came completely prepared. She knew what she had to do. She had practiced what she needed to say to David. And she had brought the food. And she could have done all of that. But the Spirit of God intervened in that time together. God softened David's heart. God gave Abigail the strength strong words of the woman that she was and said it just how it needed to be said in order to help David understand 
lots of time, the Spirit of God, when we are doing His work, just gives us that extra, mm, that exactly what we need, gives us the words that we didn't even think we had to give. And that's what God's Spirit did for Abigail and to David. In fact, so many times when I come up for children's sermon, or last week when I was getting ready to teach you in, in VBS, I prepared, I read my lesson, and I thought, okay, I'm ready to go. But I pray to God, God, use my words, soften these children's hearts, help them to understand your word. And I tell you what, those lessons when I gave them, they were beyond what my ability was. It was beyond what I was capable of doing because the Spirit of God intervened and I was able to teach you God's Word. So when we're doing God's Word, we always pray for the Spirit to lift it up to the next level. Okay? Because when we're called to do God's Word, right? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us gifts and preparing us. Help us to be strong women and men like Abigail and David, and help us to rely on your spirit to just take us to the next level of goodness, love, and peace. In your name we pray always. Amen. Thank you so much, Melinda. That was great. Love seeing all these kids, don't y'all? Will you pray with me? Lord God, we ask now that your Spirit dwells among us. That we feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. And that we know that as you dwell with us, that our worship is pleasing to you. Lord God, we ask now too that as I preach, the words coming out of my mouth are not mine, but they're yours. That through the preparation I did this week, that I was able to listen to the Holy Spirit, and those words are your words. In Christ's name, Amen. All right, well, now we just had our little kids here, um, but we had some big kids doing a lot of amazing, some amazing stuff this past week. How many of you uh, went to OMP this week? Now, y'all went to OMP. I need OMP energy. Let me know you went to OMP the way you would if you were at OMP. How would you do that? Woo! Woo! That's right. That's right. They went to OMP and they did some amazing work. But uh, what I want to know from you guys uh, at OMP, uh, did y'all get a horrible thunderstorm on Thursday? We got this horrible thunderstorm here in uh, Hot Springs on Thursday. It was my first horrible thunderstorm since I got here. And, uh, you know, I was here for band practice, and we got done around 7, and I went home, and about that time, the thunderstorm was over. But I knew when I got home from experience that Oreo, my dog, he doesn't like for his puppy paws to get wet. So he was... Uh, I, we always bring him in because he freaks out during the storms. And so I went to open the door, and I opened up the door, and Oreo wasn't waiting for me. And so I walked in. This is curious. And I, I, I learned to keep her, where's Oreo? And she says, he's in the closet. <laughs> so I go in the closet, I look around, I don't see Oreo. And then I hear this, this rustling, and I turn. Okay. Oreo is a 60-pound border collie. He's a pretty good-sized dog. And look at there. He has climbed on a shelf, and he's hiding behind my golf clubs and everything else there. And it took me a little while to coax him out, but he finally came out. I, you, I was surprised to come home and find my dog that way. I had never dreamed that I would find my border collie hiding on a shelf inside my closet. I've heard of shit, elf on a shelf, but never dog on a shelf. And, and, you know, the Holy Spirit's a lot like that. The Holy Spirit surprises us and takes us places we never thought we would go. The Holy Spirit leads us to places and gets us to do things we never thought we would do. This Holy Spirit is it, it's just a bugger because it, it, it takes us places that for the life of us, we're like, why are you taking us here, Holy Spirit? I, this is not where I want to go. 
The Holy Spirit does this all the time. And it seems like that when the Holy Spirit does this, if we just let go, the Holy Spirit will take care of everything. That we don't even have to think about what we're going to say. I mean, at least that's the way it seems in the Scripture, right? I mean, we read about uh, Peter and John coming before the, uh, the high priest and his council. Now, what you probably don't know about Peter and John, maybe you do know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence, was that both Peter and John, they grew up in a small fishing village. They were fishermen by trade. You're like, we already know this, Bill. But they didn't get any formal education. They didn't know how to read and write. Their entire life was wrapped up in learning how to fish. And what they'd do is they'd go out each evening and they would fish until morning and then sleep. And that provided them just enough to get by until Herod Antipas, who was the governor of Judea, leased out the Galilee for commercial fishing to send the fish off to Rome. So now the fish supplies are even lower and, and John and Peter spent their time just trying to make ends meet. So the background for John and Peter is that they were poor fishermen barely scraping by that couldn't even read the word cat if you put it in front of them. Never in their lifetime did they think in their wildest imaginations that they would end up talking and being on trial in front of the high priest and his council. They, they, didn't, they never would have even dreamt that. That was beyond their understanding. They were lucky to know that there was anything past Jerusalem. But here they are. They're before the high priest and his council. And the scripture tells us that the Spirit inspired Peter and John and they began to speak. And when they were done speaking, the high priest and the council were amazed. Now, what's going on here is that the Holy Spirit, according to scripture, was inspiring John and Peter. And we tend to think when we read a story like this that the Holy Spirit works through spontaneity. That open your mouth and the words just flow out. That it was almost like the Holy Spirit was a holy puppet master working Peter and John like they were a puppet and speaking for them. And a lot of people think that's the way the Holy Spirit works. I remember when I was in seminary, I was also serving the church full time. And one of my classmates comes up to me, a good friend of mine, and says, do you ever do any spirit-led preaching? I'm a preacher. Yeah. I'll. You know, and, and I'm thinking, as I'm feeling insulted by this, I'm like, yes, every week I sit down with the Holy Spirit and we go over our commentaries, we read articles, I read books, and, and I read the scripture and I pray, and the Holy Spirit from Monday through Friday tells me what to write down. She goes, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not spirit-led preaching. And I said, well, if that's not spirit-led preaching, I don't know what is. And she said, no, no, no. Spirit-led preaching is, is when you get up on a Sunday morning, you walk in front of the church, you let the Spirit pick out the scripture, and then you just start preaching. Now, I'm not going to say the Holy Spirit can't do that. But my wife knows me pretty well. And she would tell you that under no circumstances should I ever get up and start talking without thinking first. <laughs> I get in trouble. Bad things happen when I get up and start talking without thinking first. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do, actually, it might be a good idea. I could just blame it on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit told me to say that stupid thing. I don't know what the Holy Spirit was thinking. But also, you know, just being a person that believes in hospitality, isn't that kind of rude to show up to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I haven't done anything all week. Do your thing. I'm going to open my mouth. You do your thing, and we're going to go. No, 
my understanding of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit likes to get together a little bit earlier. And the Holy Spirit and I, we work together for a while. And, and I listen. And the Holy Spirit inspires. And then we begin to craft a sermon. And that's not the only thing the Holy Spirit in, inspires people to do. It's not just words. But that's the thing that I, I can talk about the easiest because that's what I do for a living. And I spend a lot of time with the Holy Spirit trying to come up with what it is that God wants you to hear each week. But unfortunately, a lot of people think that when you do that, you're getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. That when we try to prepare, we're pushing the Holy Spirit aside. That we're trying to say, Holy Spirit, no, 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 I know best. But that's not the way it works. That is not how the Holy Spirit works. You know, how many of you ever took a defensive driving course when you were growing up? My mother insisted I take it, and I'm convinced it wasn't because she was worried for my safety. She just wanted that discount on her insurance. But when I was 14, she made me go take this defensive driving class. And I went through it, and they tried us different skills. And after that, I didn't think anything about it. All I knew was I wanted to drive. Just like every 14-year-old boy wants to do. And then when I'm 16, I was so glad when I got my driver's license. And I didn't think about that defensive driving course again until I was 19. And I was driving to work down Cantrell Avenue, and it had snowed. And I was in my Jeep, and I hit an icy patch. And all of a sudden, I'm sliding down Cantrell Avenue sideways. Uh, I was in the right lane, and as I'm driving, I could look through my windshield and see into the passenger side window the people I was passing. And I passed one older lady, and she looked over at me, and I looked at her, and her eyes got this big as I slid by. Now, mind you, I hadn't thought anything about this driver's defensive driving course I took five years prior to that. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit inspired me, and everything came back. And I was able to straighten out my Jeep and just drive on like I was going, like, uh, like nothing had happened and got to work just fine. See, that's the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit inspires. The Holy Spirit takes what we have and makes it better. The Holy Spirit takes what we have prepared to do and increases it. The Holy Spirit is one that inspires. And I promise you, you may think Peter didn't prepare. You may think John didn't prepare. But you could be further from the truth. Now... Peter and John didn't spend a week before uh, they met in front of the, the high priest preparing their statement. No, they did say it in a spontaneous way, but they came in more prepared than anybody in history. Even though they were uneducated fishermen, they had spent the last three or four years following Jesus Christ around. Now, how could you be any more prepared than that? When you have been there when the Sadducees and the Pharisees tried to test Jesus and Jesus made them look like fools. How could you be any more prepared than when you were present at the Sermon on the Mount? How could you be any more prepared than when you were present when Jesus took a couple of pieces of fish and a few loaves and broke them up and fed 5,000? Peter got out of a boat and walked on water towards Jesus. Now, he only took a few steps, but they were incredible steps. And they taught him faith and trust in Jesus. See, they were prepared because they had been learning from the greatest seminary professor to ever live. They were learning from Jesus Christ himself. So when they walked in that room, the high priest and those scholars and that council didn't stand a chance because it was the high priest and his council that weren't prepared for what the Holy Spirit was doing with what Peter and John had been preparing for since the day they met Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit takes our gifts. The Holy Spirit takes our experiences. And the Holy Spirit shows us how to put it together 
for the good of God and allows us to do the things that God wants us to do. Whether that is sitting at the bedside of someone who, uh, someone who is dying and you're just holding their hand and loving them. Or if it's building a wheelchair ramp out at OMP. Now, a lot of these OMP kids, they didn't know how to build a wheelchair ramp before they met. But they were prepared by someone who did know. They had a contractor or a carpenter showing them how to do these. They had blueprints. They were being prepared. Now, a lot of modern Christianity has got in its mind that education is the enemy of faith, the enemy of the Holy Spirit, and nothing could be further from the truth because any time we are learning something new, any time we bring some kind of new knowledge, some kind of new skill into our wheelhouse, that is one more tool for the Holy Spirit to use in our lives. That is one more way that the Holy Spirit can use us to bring about God's kingdom. If you don't believe me, ask yourself this. How many of you like a surgeon that has an education, that has gone and gone to medical school, or would you rather have a surgeon that has just never been to medical school but really open to the Holy Spirit? How many of you are going to get on a plane with a pilot that has never been behind the controls, never been to flight school, but he prayed that day? How many of you are going to trust that? I mean, I don't care if the pilot stayed in a Holiday Inn Express the night before. I want a pilot that has thousands of hours in the air and has been to flight school before I'm getting on that plane. We all want surgeons that have spent years in school, that have gone through a residency and done quite a few surgeries before they cut us open. It's not because we don't trust in the Holy Spirit. It's that we know what the Holy Spirit can do with someone who is prepared. And when you prepare, the Holy Spirit can use you in mighty ways. I mean, if I was, if the Holy Spirit told me tomorrow, Bill, I want you to go on a medical mission trip to Peru, I'd go. But the last thing anybody wants me doing is pulling teeth or prescribing medicine. I'm not prepared for that. I'm prepared to sit at somebody's bedside and pray with them. I'm prepared to follow instructions if I need to change a bedpan or bandages. I can work and comfort a family who are losing, who's losing a child. But being the doctor, no. God's never going to call you and use the Holy Spirit to, to ask you to do things you're not prepared to do. God's not going to ask you do something that God didn't already give you a gift to do. God is not going to ask me to get up and sing, but He's going to ask Lauren to. Because she's prepared. She's got the gift of singing. Now, we've got these cards you may have seen on your chair. And there's all kinds of ways that you can serve in your church. And you don't have to do a whole lot of preparing to do this. I mean, reading Scripture, if you can read, you can do this. I promise. And most of these hard words, nobody else in the crowd knows how to say either. So any way you say it, they're going to think you're right. Setting up communion. If you can squirt some juice into a cup, I've got a job for you. You're prepared by the Holy Spirit. Serving communion. If you can break off some bread and say, the body of Christ broken for you, or hand out a cup, or hold out a cup, man, you're prepared. The Holy Spirit's got you ready. If you can say, how are you doing? You could be a greeter. You see how hard this stuff is? Or, you know, I'm not going to say stage designs for everybody, but if you can look up on this stage and you can go, a paintbrush and a robot does not go with this sermon. You might be a stage designer. See, God wants to use us with the gifts we have. God wants us to take those gifts and prepare the best we can to use those gifts. If God has gifted you in a way if to be a cook, the Holy Spirit might call you to cook for the homeless. 
They like warm meals too. But if God calls you to cook for the homeless and you don't know how to cook, it might be a good idea to prepare for taking a cooking class. Sometimes skills can be acquired. See, that's what I'm talking about. Prepare. Read your scripture. Pray. Study. Visit with people. To be a reader, all you have to do is practice being nice to people. That's all you got to do. That's how you prepare for it. Some people, that's harder than others. But it's okay. And you know, to be, to go and visit someone in the hospital who's sick and hurting, all you have to do is not have to sit there and hold somebody's hand. It's not a hard skill to get. But working up the courage and preparing yourself to go and do that, that's a little bit harder. God calls us all to prepare. And one of the ways that God prepares us is through grace. See, grace transforms us. Grace makes us new. Grace makes us more than we ever thought we could be. And as United Methodists, we believe that we receive grace through sacraments. We have two sacraments in the United Methodist Church. Baptism and Holy Communion. You may have noticed we're doing communion more often than not because I want you prepared. I want you to feel what the Holy Spirit does in your life. And I want you to feel the grace. You can never get enough grace in your life. If you've got enough grace in your life, please share some with us. And God transforms us. I don't want you to miss out on a moment in which God transforms you, transforms you or prepares you for whatever it is God has in store in your life. So I want you to receive as much grace as possible. Grace is what makes us more like Christ. Grace is what strength, strengthens us when we feel weak. And grace is a gift from the Holy Spirit. This is why we come to the table each week. This is why John Wesley said, Take communion as often as you can. This is a sacred meal. Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit descend upon these elements of bread and wine. Ordinary things that you've taken and made extraordinary. The same way the Holy Spirit takes our experiences, takes our learning, takes our gifts from ordinary people and gets us to do extraordinary things we never thought we were capable of. God, transform these elements to the body and blood of Jesus Christ for us so that we might receive that grace, so that we might receive forgiveness, so that we might be strengthened and nourished in a way that only you can do for us. All honor and glory is yours now, yours now and forever, Almighty God. And because we believe that you do miraculous things at this table. We pray the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See, Christ took the bread because bread symbolizes life, food, what we need to live. And He broke the bread, giving it to His disciples, saying, Take, eat. I'm going to become broken so you can be made whole so that you may be nourished and you may live a life abundant. Likewise, at the end of the meal, we took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave the cup to His disciples, saying, Take, drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for many, so that you may be forgiven of your sins and you may live a life transcendent of this world and that you may offer my grace as I offer 
my grace to you, you may offer to others. Amen. Those who are assisting and serving, I want to invite you to come forward. through this, but uh, I'll explain first. These two rows are going to exit to my right. And you'll come around and go left. There are, all, there are dealers that you may uh, sit at, uh, sit at, pray at, after you receive. This row, y'all are a little bit different. Y'all are going to exit to your left, come around to my left, and come around to my right so that you may also sit in need. The United Methodist Church, we believe this isn't our table. This is Jesus' table. And everyone is welcome in Jesus' table. Jesus is the greatest host. Because Jesus invites the broken, the hurting. Jesus invites those that think they're not deserving. And says, yes you are because I love you. As long as you come seeking Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're Methodist, Baptist, never stepped in a church before. This is your first time. You're invited. Those of you who wish to come and receive grace, I invite you to come and eat. Thank you. 
through that last chorus one more time if Christ has spoken to you today. If you need to make a decision for Jesus to come into your life, we'd love to talk to you about that. Or if you would like to join this church as we prepare to do the work that the Holy Spirit calls us to, I'd like to talk to you about that as well. Or if you just need to pray, I'd be glad to pray with you.